So now some of the problems with, with the Marxist perspective seems to be that um, victimhood, the sense of enhanced victimhood tends to produce an intense sense of resentment and that's a very bad idea because resentment is a very toxic and violent emotion. It's also very ungrateful, which is one of the things I would really say about especially the radical left student types, especially at Ivy League universities. I mean, it's really quite a spectacle to see people at places like Yale come out and agitate as a consequence of the realization of their own oppression when by any reasonable standard, current or historical, they're probably in the top one one hundredth of a percent, perhaps better than that, of all the people who have ever lived anywhere, ever. And so it really, it's, really, it's really quite staggering to me that the top 0.001% can express their resentment about the top 0.0001% in such strident terms without noticing that exactly the same claims of privilege apply to them by as long as all you have to do is transform the the, the bin in which you're doing the, the privileged comparisons and that becomes immediately self-evident and you know the fact that as Americans let's say or as North Americans since I'm a Canadian that we're staggeringly privileged compared to the rest of the world is certainly a consequence of the of the, what you might describe as the arbitrariness of our political borders and so but to forget that when you're claiming a particular brand of oppression for yourself seems to me to be very ungrateful at the least and certainly motivated let's say politically because I think it justifies your expression of hatred for those that tiny fraction of people who are still better off than you and also a degree of historical ignorance that's absolutely staggering in its magnitude and a complete indictment of our education system which should be indicted in every possible way so now the Marxists might claim to their benefit, let's say, with this world view of class struggle as being the primary driver of human history and the well-off socioeconomically, because that's pretty much the only way they define well-off, which is also something I take great objection to, because there's lots of hierarchies in the world, and there are many important hierarchies, and not all of them can be reduced to socioeconomic status by any stretch of the imagination. Imagine if you were 80 years old and you had 20 million dollars, you know. You might be perfectly happy to get rid of all that money if you could be 18 again. So it's, and you know, one of the best predictors of wealth in North America is actually age, because you know, young people haven't actually had much time to make money, whereas old people have had quite a bit of time, but the problem with being old and rich is that you're still old. And <laughs> that actually turns out to be quite a serious problem, because no matter how rich you are, you eventually die. And so the money, is, the money has a very delimited, if, delimited effect with regards to addressing the fundamental problems of the suffering of life. And we know perfectly well from the empirical perspective that once you have enough money so that the bill collectors aren't chasing you around, essentially, something like the beginnings of a middle class existence or maybe the upper end of the working class, then additional money has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on your psychological well-being. And that's actually an indication of the limitations of material comfort, let's say, as a medication for the, for the suffering that's attendant on life. It's another thing that's very weak about the Marxists and I think very interestingly contradictory because they're very anti-capital in their structure but they're so damn materialistic that it's absolutely mind-boggling because the Marxists are actually more convinced that money is useful than most capitalists as far as I can tell because they believe that that money is in fact the solution to all life's problems the problem is is that just the right people don't have the money and I think that's a staggeringly naive perspective because there's many there's many problems in life that money just cannot solve and there's a fair number of them that it actually makes worse so anyways having said all that you could also still make the case I used to work for a socialist party in Canada when I was a kid about six about the time I was 14 till the time I was about 17 before I figured out what was wrong not so much with socialism per se but with ideology per se and I actually admired the, the socialist leaders that I had the fortune to be introduced to because at that point they were very much uh, 
voice for the working class, a lot of union leaders and people like that, you know, so they're classic democratic socialists on the labor end of the distribution. And it's absolutely necessary for labor and the working class to have a political voice, something the Democrats might keep in mind. So, and maybe they wouldn't lose their elections quite so frequently. <laughs> no, I really think it's appalling, you know, because it's necessary for the working class to have a political voice. So, and to have that transformed into identity politics is a real catastrophe. Anyways, I think that the people that I met, many of them were genuinely concerned with the problems of the working class and, you know, more power to them. And so I think there are people on the left who, who genuinely are trying to make a difference for people who could use a, a fair shot at opportunity in life. But at the same time, I noticed that a tremendous number of the people, especially the lower end worker, uh, party worker, pr protester types were more peevish and resentful than good hearted and kind. And it was about that time that I came across George Orwell's famous critique of left wing thinking in, in the UK when, in a book called Road to Wigan Pier, where he basically made the claim that the socialists that he knew, especially the middle class ones, didn't give a damn about the poor, they just hated the rich. And that's, I mean, that is something worth thinking about for a very long period of time because hatred actually turns out to be a very powerful motivation. You know, and, and if you think about the sorts of things that happened in the Soviet Union and all these places that were supposed to be workers' paradises, if you look at the outcome and you had to infer whether it was goodness of heart and kind-heartedness and care for the working man that produced the genocides or outright bitter resentful, resentment and hatred, it's a lot easier to draw a causal path from the negative emotion to the outcome than from the positive, kind-hearted benevolence to the out. You just don't get gulags out of benevolence. That's just not how it works. So I think the bloody historical evidence is clear. Um, although I have read the most convoluted, pathological, pathetic, twisted rationalizations of what happened stay in Stalinist Russia that you could possibly manufacture. It's as if an, a stack of corpses that would reach halfway to the moon isn't enough evidence for the pathology of a certain form of belief. So, well, some people can't be convinced by anyone's death but their own, I suppose.